let's see. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the roundtable discussion, uh, I realize we have a lot of people here. I want to get, get a chance for everybody to say a little bit. Um, uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, Steve Jervitson, who's going to be um, uh, co-organizing uh, this panel with me. He's a partner at Draper Fisher Jervitson, one of the leading venture capital firms here in Silicon Valley. And they've been doing a lot of work in these sorts of AI, nanotech type, uh, type areas over the last, uh, last few years. So, Steve, you want to take, sure. start off with asking yeah, a question I, to I, everybody I'd, here? I'd love to ask a lot of questions. And, oh, can you hear me OK? Uh, is microphone 14 on? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I have pages of questions, so I may only get one in, and so I'll make it long and verbose. But it's a question that uh, I'd love to ask to everyone who spoke on the topics of AI and nanotech, and in particular Kurzweil, Eliezer, and, and Drexler, where you here. And it really is something I've been struggling with for a while, um, and that is this dichotomy between design and evolutionary search. And I think you've heard the most interesting and thought-provoking examples are places that blur the distinction. So what do I mean by that? You can design things, purposefully build them. And I think Ellie talks about some of these in self-modifying code, where you can take subsystems, you can modify things, and maintain functionality by purpose. Then there's evolutionary search, which is incredibly different. Right? You barely can control outcomes. It unpacks into massive complexity. And you don't necessarily understand what will happen to you run the experiment. It happens to be the place where we have an existence proof of greater and greater intelligence being created in the biological domain. But it leads to systems that are inscrutable. You can't just cut and paste subsystems from the brain and understand how they work. The reason the brain is difficult to understand is because it was evolved. In fact, it co-evolved in the world as we know it, something that Hostetler referred to. The same is true for genetic algorithms, genetic programs, and neural networks. When you produce something via that method, the product is itself inscrutable. You can't just go in and engineer the result without a lot of work, about as much work as it would take to reverse engineer the brain, I might add, for any artificial intelligence of comparable complexity. But you hear a lot of blurring and blending of these two domains. If you were, if these are polar extremes, it does what I tell it to do, or I grow it, and it's magical, and it does great things, but it's out of control. These Kevin Kelly's words. So if I take uploading, for example, uploading seems to be one of these interesting hybrid blends. Uh, and my question will be around what the gating factor is for its success. Is it brute force? Can I do an upload? Or is it systems level understanding? And if we think about it, for those who might not be familiar, what some people referred to, Douglas and others, in, in Kurzweil's conclusions are that we might be able to upload human intelligence to a silicon substrate. And as we learned from Christine, more likely a bonobo uh, uh, substrate, much, I mean, a source code much more quickly because the FDA approval process will start us with bonobos long before humans. This is Brad Templeton's idea. And, and I might say that is a much more palatable future than any other I've heard painted today, for those who know <laughs> the bonobo sexual habits. So back to the question. Um, and, uh, offline, ask Brad about that. Um, the question about uploading is, um, there are a lot of roboticists and neuroscientists who believe the mind cannot exist in the jar, right, would be the metaphor, the mind-body, if you will, uh, unification, that our senses do not work without three-dimensional motion, primarily touch and sight, and that if you were to, in some way, do a mechanical engineering cut and paste of the brain onto some other substrate without the body and its co-evolutionary world in which it lives, that it may be quite unpredictable. In particular, one just tiny little example that came to my mind during today's talk was phantom limb pain. It's one of the few examples we have with human bodies today where you amputate a limb, some people have excruciating, debilitating pain that does not arise anywhere within the sensory system except it comes from the neocortex. It's a neuroplasticity problem, if you will, in the sensory cortex. And I guess the question would be, if one could upload a brain, would there be any reason to expect that that experiment would work short of system level understanding of the brain itself. I mean, if we don't really understand how the brain works, would that be a fool's errand to make that assumption? And maybe that is your assumption, that these two paths of learning will contemporaneously reach the ability to port and the ability to understand what we're porting and what we're cutting and pasting. Well, you asked maybe about three you know, related questions. On genetic algorithms, which we use quite a bit, uh, and Doug mentioned John Coase's work and the state of genetic algorithms in the year 2000. And I think at that time, they suffered from the fact that you'd have a set genome, each, each gene, each field that was being evolved would have a specific function. And then you would evolve it with having all these simulated organisms, each with a genetic code. They would interact in the simulated environment uh, and evolve a more intelligent solution. But, and you would see an acceleration, but then you'd see a saturation of capability. And what they were missing were some elements that we'd see see in biological evolution that did not exist in that generation of genetic algorithm. The, fact, the ability to add new genetic information, similar to adding new genes or new chromosomes, the ability to reassign the meaning of the, of the function of specific genes, and the genetic information that would affect the expression of other genes 
which we see in bio biology in, in terms of the non-coding regions that we now understand. Uh, we don't fully understand how they work. Uh, control the, the expression of other genes. Uh, there are new generations of genetic algorithms that have principles along these lines. They do work much better. They're able to keep evolving longer. And uh, since we have more, they require a lot more computation, but we have more computation. And uh, we can, and they can be very impressive in solving problems. My, my own view, though, is it's, it's work, a, Sorry, Bacosa's work, it keeps going, but it produces an answer that when you look at it, doesn't make sense. It's a new solution to a problem that doesn't immediately lend itself to uh, human They can be, these self-organizing methods like neural nets and genetic algorithms, uh, it can be hard to interpret the results. Uh, but actually, there are ways of, of looking at the winning solution and understanding what it's doing. It takes a bit of reverse engineering that, just like we're now trying to reverse engineer this product of exactly. an evolutionary process. Uh, you have to actually reverse engineer it, but you can do that. Uh, but it's not a magic bullet. It wasn't back in the year 2000. It's not today. My own view is we will, through expanding this AI toolkit, through the kind of work Sebastian does, through hints that we get through understanding the principles of operation of the human brain, through the kind of work that Doug does in terms of trying to understand symbolic reasoning as it's embodied in the products of human intelligence, like language. Uh, these will intersect ultimately. We'll have some general principles that, if put together in the right way and optimized in the right way, uh, could be a strong AI. And then we can use a genetic algorithm to enhance its overall performance. It's really an enhancement or optimization technique uh, and it can't come up with creative solutions, but it's really one tool we have in this whole toolkit of self-organizing methods. The whole uploading idea, I mean, first of all, I don't think that idea is necessary uh, for all the discussions we've had here in terms of the singularity. The, the concept in singularity is really to create human-level intelligence, to pass the Turing test of, of, a, of a human-level intelligence, but not necessarily pass a Ray Kurzweil or Doug Hofstadter Turing test. Uh, and even if you did that, I mean, you get some important and real philosophical questions. Is that really me? If you came to me in the morning and said, good news, Ray, we scanned your brain from inside and uh, we've now reinstantiated in another substrate. We don't need your old body and brain anymore. And, I know, and it has these right problems anyway. Uh, so we got this new, better one. I may have a different perspective on that because I'm still here. And uh, you can argue uh, that that's a different person especially since I could, st in theory, still be around. Um, I don't think you could, in theory, upload uh, even a specific person uh, without really understanding how human intelligence works. I think that's a much more challenging scenario than creating human-level intelligence in general. Mm -hmm. I do think we'll ultimately get to a point where you could learn enough about a specific person by observing their behavior, observing them also from inside, scanning from inside, and seeing uh, what's going on in sufficient detail to create something that would pass a Ray Kurzweil Turing test. But uh, you can make a strong argument that that's still a different person uh, that just is simulating someone else's personality. Uh, but in any event, that whole scenario is not integral to what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is capturing strong AI, AI that has, we've already have narrow AI in a hundred narrow areas, and the narrowness of that na narrow AI, driving cars, chess, translating languages is becoming less narrow over time. Ultimately, it, w it will, in my view, have the fluidity and flexibility of human intelligence, and then we'll continue on this uh, exponential progression. It's important to understand that that's a very powerful combination. If you just have human-level intelligence and combine it with what this thing can do, remember billions of facts accurately, we're hard-pressed to remember a handful of phone numbers. Once it learns something, like translating a language, you can do it quickly and repetitively, and most importantly, it can share its knowledge at electronic speeds, which is pointed out is a million times faster than human language. Uh, that's a very formidable combination. And then will it continue to be able to improve its own performance? Uh, so uploading is really a side issue. Uh, I do think that you know, anything that's human-like needs some kind of senses. Certainly, if you were to just somehow capture one personality and put it in the substrate and didn't give it uh, some kind of input, uh, senses, and just tell it, go think about these problems, it probably would go psychotic pretty quickly. Uh, we do have a certain psychology, and I don't think that's a good experiment to run. I think we're going to get there gradually, create 
systems for practical reasons. These practical systems will ultimately get more and more flexible over time and ultimately create uh, some uh, s impressive capabilities. Uh, and, as, and they do have sensors. I mean, Sebastian's AI has sensors. Uh, and it also has uh, limbs uh, in the form of wheels and so on. So it, it, it is a taking in information, it's processing intelligently, and, and it's an actor. Uh, and these systems will become more fluid, will operate at, at finer and finer levels as we go forward. Let me, um, I want to actually sort of maybe ask a quick question to everybody on the panel, and then, uh, Elias, do you want to say something? Well, actually, I sort of like wanted to, I mean, is a question to me too, I was. Well, like to I would be <laughs> curious when you talk about, um, you know, that you wouldn't want to kill people, and if you could modify your code, you'd preserve that instinct. I mean, the question comes socialization versus, you know, nature versus nurture debate. Do you not kill people because it's embedded in your DNA, or is it because of the way you were brought up? And so really yes. the question of blurring these is, what gives you any hope that if you mix design and evolution in the same environment that you get the parts you want and not the parts you don't want? Well, I, um, actually, uh, I did want to make one quick comment, which is that I was slightly misquoted um, with respect to those uh, three questions. Uh, why does anything exist? Uh, what's consciousness? And what's the meaning of life? Uh, that was something I wrote when I was very young, and I hadn't read my Janes, and I thought that mysterious questions could have mysterious answers. And moreover, I just wanted to know the answer for myself. I was not suggesting that the whole human species would think about it all day. Um, with respect to genetic algorithms, I would warn you not to make the same mistake I made, which is that human beings tend to go funny in the head when they're around things that they don't understand. We have a much, we, I think we have a more powerful instinct to worship the unknown than to explain it, which is why um, even today uh, it's still a lot easier to transmit a religion than to transmit a science. And in, in particular, um, don't be too impressed with the power of evolution. The power of evolution gets emphasized a lot in popular science because it's so difficult and so important to explain to people that evolution works at all. But when professional biologists get together, they're more likely to talk about the known limitations of evolution. It's very slow. We can derive mathematical speed limits on evolution. For example, if two parents have eight children and two of those children survive and reproduce, which over the long run you have to have only two children surviving and reproducing, or the population goes to infinity or zero. So that's absorbing two bits of information from the environment. If you had 16 kids and two of them survived and reproduced, that'd be absorbing three bits of information from the environment. And that bound is over the entire uh, gene pool. If you Google on a speed limit for evolution, you'll, you'll, find, uh, you'll find a paper describing that. But uh, the point is, is that evolution absorbs on the order of one bit per generation, while humans absorb on the order of one bit per second. And that's because we take advantage of regularities in the search space that evolution, natural selection, cannot begin to comprehend. We learn laws and combine them deductively and apply them. And because of this, we can do design and reasoning at a much higher level of I don't need to try a million things at random to find one thing that work that one thing that works. I can just fly straight to the solution, and this is where you'd have the ability to, to. And if you had a sufficiently powerful version of this ability, something with the same strength as mathematical proof. Now that doesn't mean like modern-day automated theorem provers, because they are not powerful enough to do designs of the size of the mind. But human mathematicians can handle proofs much larger than modern automated theorem provers. We just don't do it as certainly. When engineers want to prove a chip correct that has 155 million interlocking parts, they have human engineers choosing lemmas that are proven by a complex theorem prover and verified by a simple verifier so they can, take, so they, they can combine the ability that humans have to do these very large designs and the ability that computers have to verify them with a very high uh, degree of confidence. And a similar combination of abilities might be what you would need to make one million sequential self-modifications to yourself without going insane on any one of them. And I don't think that the, the current, uh, that technologies like neural nets or genetic algorithms will ever have that properly because they don't exploit the right regularities in the search space and because they are too opaque. 
and I'm actually to some extent worried that's, that some of our most advanced modern techniques are opaque because it could mean that we got a general AI or self-improving AI that we were still confused about and we couldn't reach exactly into the design space. But I do believe that the problem is solvable in principle that um, you can have a intellig that intelligent reasoning is demonstrably a lot more powerful than evolutionary reasoning. We can't describe intelligence as, it, intelligence is a lot more complicated, so we can't describe it mathematically the way we can describe evolution mathematically. But we can describe evolution mathematically, and the math says evolution is pretty stupid. So I think that we can get intelligence and intelligent self, uh, self modification, and I don't think we can get that out of um, genetic programming or neural networks unless there's a foundational change in how those algorithms work. One of the questions I'd like to ask the whole audience, maybe to pick off on some of the things uh, that um, Eliezer and Ray and some of the other people have talked about, and um, I realize a lot of you will be tempted to say that you don't know the answer to this, but I would like to get your best guess answer to two questions. Question number one is, what year do you expect us to have strong AI? Um, and question number two, what probability do you assign to a strong AI leading to a world that you would consider to be better than the world we're living in today. So why don't we just, uh, if we could just go around and, uh, how about Ray, what would be your, what would be your guess to those two questions, the answers to those uh, two I'm, questions? I'm, I'm, my date has uh, stayed the same since my first book, although I had a range for, uh, for my first book, which was, uh, but uh, in the age of spiritual machines, I said 2029, and uh, I've stayed with that, with that date. Uh, and probability that it will lead to a better world. Uh, I'd, I'd say I've increased my uh, confidence in that. Uh, I think if we don't have a catastrophic outcome, it's it's extremely high. I think there is a risk of. Uh, <laughs> but that's sort of like saying, Mrs. Lincoln. Besides that, how do you like the play? <laughs> and I and I think uh, and I'm also concerned about. Another square, uh, and Nick Bostrom's uh, chart, which is uh, not fully existential, but you know, just something like a, uh, let's say, a bioterrorist weapon that doesn't kill everyone, but it kills you know, millions of people, or, or even a nuclear bomb in one city. I mean, uh, that would not disrupt these trends. It would not disrupt uh, the progression of human civilization, but it'd be extremely painful to go through, and I, I worry a lot about that. Uh, but overall, I, th I think if you look at today compared to hundreds of years ago, we are, most of us, better, measurably better off. Uh, so I'd say 90% likelihood that uh, it will improve profoundly uh, human life. And what, so what, what number would you give on the probability? 90. 90%? Yeah. Uh, Professor Hofstadter, any? Yeah, I, I, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to object to the term strong AI because that's borrowed from John Searle and you're playing his game. Um, strong AI for John Searle, the definition of it is the, it's not a certain level of AI. It is the notion that when you are creating artificial intelligence that the thing that you produce actually, as he would put it, has intentionality or has semantics or um, ha is conscious. To John Searle, the idea is you could have something that passes the Turing test or is even smarter than that. It still wouldn't be strong AI because it would be vacuous inside. It would have no feelings, no consciousness. It would not be, its symbols would be vacuous and empty. So I want to just emphasize that the term strong AI has sometimes been misused. It is a term that is, I never use it. Okay, let's use, uh, let's use AGI. Artificial general intelligence. Yeah, something, human level intelligence is what you're saying. Turing test passing <coughs> intelligence. I just wanted to okay. change the, the term. Um, you know, I, I, I will hedge because I'm not a futurist. I'm a futurologist. I have never been one, and I don't know how to think about the future very well. Perhaps that's why I find all of this so mystifying. Um, but if you wanted me to put a, a number on it, I, I, would, I, I can toss out a number. Uh, I will un undoubtedly be very uncomfortable with whatever number I say, but just for the hell of it, I'll say 2100. 
And then uh, your other question, whether that is for good or for not good, that's a very subtle question because it's for the good of whom? Uh, from your perspective. Well. I, I made the question subjective. You know, I, I again, I, as, as I said, I, I was the person who wrote the article, Who Will Be We in 2093, and then changed the title to 2493. But in both cases, the idea was that perhaps we would improve uh, the, 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 our, by creating our own successors, whether they might be robots or whether they might be software beings inhabiting a kind of a cyberspace, by creating our own successors, we might possibly create more moral beings. I had no qualms about that idea that it could be, but the probability that it would be, that is, is so blurry to me, I'm afraid I, I, I would not have any way of estimating such a pro pro probability. Um, does this work? <laughs> yeah, four digits, that will work. Uh, uh, my main thing here is to try to dodge a little bit. I have actually written some paper, which seems a long time ago, where I think I said something like 50% probability before 2040 or something. Uh, now, um, I feel very uncertain um, about this, even more on the second question. Um, so maybe a more useful thing to contribute if all are going to give their probability estimates was just one little other item from that um, PowerPoint slide with different biases, which seems relevant here. Uh, well, be less than four digits. Um, so this little experiment um, illustrates calibration and overconfidence, overconfidence problems. So a thousand um, general knowledge questions were asked of subjects, um, general questions about the world. And the people who were asked uh, were asked to state an answer and then a confidence interval. So um, what is a 98% confidence interval? That you're, you feel 98% certain that the answer lies within this interval. Um, and it turned out that, so here is the, uh, uh, the answer to that, uh, that events to which subjects assigned a probability of 2%, that is, lying outside that 98% interval, happened 42% uh, of the time, 42.6% of the time. Um, so the four digits that I would nominate here is 2% happens 42.6% of the time, according to this study. And so these exact numbers vary according to different studies, but the general finding is, is similar across the studies, and it's very striking, uh, which is that people are very, very bad at putting numbers uh, to uh, their level of certainty. Uh, maybe it's because they're bad at putting numbers to it, or maybe it's just because uh, we don't really know how ignorant we are about a lot of things. So can, you, can you use that fact to make a better prediction, or does it not, not help? <laughs> Well, I mean, the, 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 the way you would use this would be by expanding um, your uncertain interval, which is intrinsically very difficult to do. If the question is, give me a year, um, or, or give me a probability number. So I would rather say than pick a year, you would say pick a long interval and say that within that interval you have at least a 50% chance of uh, the event happening. Uh, and so um, the gist of that would be, I would say, it's. Uh, you would have to pick a rather big interval to be rather sure that it is within that interval. <laughs> and, um, and how about how about how about the uh, how about what would be your interval? What would be your two sigma confidence interval for um, for this being a good event or bad event when it does happen? Two well, sigma interval. For what Nin Ninety-eight percent. For for which question? That this would be a good thing or a bad thing. So that's yes, no. This is the second. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. <laughs> The second, the second part of the question. So, uh, let's My say two you, sigma. Well, I don't know. Yes or no, or something else completely. <laughs> well, no. What's like? We what say the probability is ten percent to thirty percent. Is it ninety percent to ninety-nine percent? What would be your your estimate of? You want to give a range. So, what's the range of he probability? Zero to one. That, he says zero to hundred percent. Zero to hundred. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. but if you want to give me. And if you want me to give you a proposition in which I'm 98% confident in, that could be an answer to that question. Um, it, it would have to be a very disjunctive proposition. 
Um, uh, so it would have to include it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, uh, the sense of good and bad as it makes sense in this context. It's a bit of both. It's something different altogether. Um, it's <laughs> All right. Well, well, let me let me actually let me just open it to the rest of the panel. Does anybody have um, perhaps irrationally and uh, for psychologically crazy reasons have um, a greater confidence interval on uh, where where they think these numbers uh, might might be? Yeah. 2025 with the bonobos. Two more cell divisions and their brains would be as big as ours. <laughs> <laughs> then it would take another 20 years to grow them into children, adults, teenage years would be tough, socialization, a little ostracization. I think, I think it's 2,101. <laughs> 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 because it's, it's awfully far away and I'm going to be closer to it than Doug will by at least one year. <laughs> and and do, you have a, do you have a sense on the probabil probability? Is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it'll look good in, in hindsight. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make a, a side comment here, given the uh, strong involvement of the singularity and the word human level AI or strong AI in that um, over the last 30 years, the development in major AI labs like the one that John McCarthy started here at Stanford uh, has actually been away from uh, integrated human level AI and much more into smart systems, uh, data analysis, and so on. And I think it's going to be a big factor in determining how fast we will do it. Not how fast we can do it, but how fast we will do it. Um, any views on probability of being a good thing or a bad thing? I just said, and I said it'd be great. It'll be great. The ones who survive will like it. But we're, we're like, for, from the point of view of us sitting in this, this audience today, the rather, winners will define it as great. rather than <laughs> the people who write the history books. For some values if we of write the history and books. some values of like, yes. If we get it Actually, exactly I, right. this is a personal assessment thing. I mean, good, good and bad are value systems. To me, uh, I'm a big fan of, of technology and of, of the way we're altering our planet in many ways. Um, you can find many, many people who are suffering from these same changes, and it really depends on whom you ask. I bet the majority of people in this room have benefited more than they've. But if you go outside the room, uh, you find lots of people who have suffered a lot. I have a kind of an answer to that. I mean, first of all, I, I'm very determined in saying I, I won't answer the question as it's asked. Um, because I, I think it's, there's a problem with the question in that uh, it sort of assumes there is a, a fixed future. And really the whole point of what I was discussing was that uh, we can shape that future with the right kinds of policies. And I was a little disturbed that Ellie so, so quickly sort of threw out the directionary principle. Perhaps you misunderstood what I was suggesting that make it a hardcore part of the programming rather than the set of guidelines to guide research. Um, but I think it's... Uh, the probability depends very much on what we do, including having these discussions here and getting people to think about them uh, more comprehensively. So I don't think, you know, there's no way I give a probability, let alone a date. Uh, I think what I would say is it very much depends on what we do and we need to do our best to increase that probability, whatever it may be. Uh, but, uh, uh, when you th do you think, do you, think um, do you have any idea when it, when it might happen or if, it, if, it's, nev if it's never going to happen? No, then, uh, I, 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 I think Nick, Nick said very much what I would say about this point, but, uh, Again, you know, the overconfidence bias, um, some of the stuff I skipped over in my talk, we, we tend to overestimate our abilities, and I'm very aware of that, and I actually kind of adjusted my own assessment of my own competence about that, so I don't, I don't make any kind of guesses. Um, but I, I, all I say is I think it will be before the end of this century, but that's as, uh, sort of as precise as I'll get. If you, were, uh, if you were saying that the correctionary principle should be used to guide friendly AI research rather than being coded, then I do apologize. I, okay. I completely yeah. Well, that, that was just yeah. for freezing on my part then. John. So I have a ballpark guess. Uh, I've ballparked it at around 2060 um, for generalized human competitive machine intelligence using uh, John Coase's HCMI term, which is like the AGI term. Um, but I think, uh, you know, Werner Vinci talks about signs of the singularity and what would be the kind of early weak signals that we're, we're approaching that generalized capacity. Um, and for me, I think the big elephant in the room is uh, are these kind of network collective natural language processing systems that we're building right now on top of our internet. And, and, I, and I think Google is going to be an excellent litmus test for that. And um, our average uh, verbal communication is 11 words. And uh, in 1998, you and I were using a tool called AltaVista to have an average of a 1.5 word query to, to the Oracle. And when we developed Google, we doubled that in five years to 2.6 words. Now, uh, I think there's a very good case that can be made that we're going to see an exponential growth 
roughly exponential up to that 11 words um, over the next uh, 14 years. We're going to see the doubling to 5.2 in 2012, and we're going to see a doubling again to 10.4 circa 2019. And, and I think that's still not true AGI, but what that is is incredibly, a lot, there's going to be a lot of grammars in the systems. You know, uh, the NLP problem is the hardest problem. So uh, if circa 20, 2015, 20, 2012 to 2019, we've actually got pretty good voice rec uh, you know, available through the network, um, then uh, the real limiter is going to be kind of how we collectively add more context-dependent grammars to this collective NLP system that we're building. And, and I believe that, you know, it, uploading may not be a key issue for this transition, but, but I, think, I think a concept that William Bainbridge calls personality capture will be. I think that if we're starting to speak to our computers in seven, you know, eight-word sentences 20, circa 2015, and they're speaking back to this uh, in this pidgin language, they're going to start ca capturing our stories, start capturing our personality. And, and I would argue that we may not hit singularity by 2060, but by 2050, when my mom dies, I think my digital mom will be 50% her. I believe all of her stories, a lot of her values, a lot of her personality will be kind of successive first approximation captured in these, in these digital twins, these avatars that we have. And, and I think that's a hugely empowering thing. So for me, I look at early, signal, early signals like that, and, and I think it would be a great long bet to have whether we'll, we'll have 5.2 word queries to Google in 2012, and, and, and I think that, that should be done. Christine. Well, Peter, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone on the stage here is actually working on AGI directly. Is that correct? Anybody directly working on that? I don't think well, so. What do you mean by I'm working on theory I mean, directly? trying to code it. Not, not, Personally, not, you know, not, running an effort. Well, I'm supposed to code As it Sebastian once I'm done with the theory. It's but. not the in thing. <laughs> right? It's not the in thing for actually, academics. Actually, we do have a, a, right? a project at Stanford that just started so. under Andrew Ng, but, where we're trying to, it's called the Stanford AI Robot. We're basically reviving the roots that Nielsen and others laid with, with uh, Shaky and, and trying to look into the key things. Uh, just a comment on the, on the importance of grammar. Um, I happen to disagree with that. I think uh, representation of knowledge, uh, learning, uh, and, and to some extent common sense, the type of things that, that John has been talking about for so many years and Marvin Minsky are really uh, missing. I think if it's just better grammars, it'll just talk stupid things to us, but in wonderful, well-formed sentences. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, agree with you that, that there's very little research right now in the nation. Uh, I think, yeah. to me, the, the picture is a bit of a pendulum. When we started looking at this, we felt it was, it was important to bring things together, these islands. And we did this for a while, and there were a lot of, of, of strange claims made in the field. And then lots of people went into more applied uh, industrial settings, where you build the world's best speech translator, or the world's best vision machine, or the world's best chess player. And we've really perfectionized this in the field. So if you go to places like MIT and Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, you, you find this kind of research a lot. And that's like first grade artificial intelligence. I think we're watering down the, the word artificial intelligence to become a, an advanced computing uh, department more than an AI department. And who knows, maybe in the next couple of, of years we can swing back, we can say, uh, Let's see what we have achieved technologically and if we can really provide the glue in between uh, as a way to, to understand how to put the pieces together. I think it's a challenge. In fact, I, I wish there's some great young students in the audience that would pick up that challenge and, and do a bit. See, and I couldn't quite hear like your question. In fact, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing oh. people speaking. I, I, the people out there hearing the panel okay? Uh, you're sounding fuzzy to me, but uh, what was your question, Christine? Is anybody working on what? We better move on from that since it got derailed. My point was that um, working on uh, AGI is not the in thing now in uh, academic labs. Um, however, there are uh, efforts outside academia. In fact, there are some guys sitting right down here. Okay, that's yeah, you guys. Uh, yeah, well, that's hands what hands I hands. thought you said, but I mean, I don't think that's how we're going to get there by somebody working on human level intelligence today. I think it's adva advancing on many different fronts. So there are 50,000 people working in neuroscience in some aspect. And they're not necessarily, wouldn't say I'm working on reverse engineering the brain, but they're modeling one ion channel or one dendrite. Or, that's one whole area of activity. There's a lot of AI work 
lot of which is mundane and practical to get a better narrow AI system for some industrial application. And a lot of people working on different forms of computing technologies. I mean, all of these incremental steps, thousands of them, in many different fields, are all going to contribute ultimately to this end result. Yeah, this isn't going to be one project I'm working on uh, human level intelligence. Are you intelligence. saying, Ray, that you don't think there's a shortcut? Because I think there may be a shortcut. And I think, you know, I know some guys who are working on it, and we have to watch for that. I think, I think it's unlikely, but uh, I think it's going to proceed incrementally. These, these fields are progressing in an exponential manner, and we will get there through this incremental, fairly broadly defined effort. Let me, uh, let me uh, start shifting over to some questions from the audience, and I'll start with one that I think uh, continues the thread that uh, we're on right now from uh, Pedro Cab Carabello Nieva. Um, and it's a question for Ray and Eliezer. Um, and they use the word strong AI, so we'll uh, with all. Uh, so it, is it possible to predict the arrival of strong AI or AGI as a result of exponential trends, or will strong AI arise from one fundamental event that occurs at an unpredictable point in time. And this also goes to Steve's question about the sort of the design versus evolution debate. Didn't I, ju didn't I just answer that? Eliza, do you want to take a crack at it? Sure. Um, well, this is actually pretty much the same answer I was going to give, give to the last question, which is that another one of the uh, things you learn from studying the biases and what you can try to do to compensate in some small ways for them is an awareness of how hard a problem is. And when a problem is harder, you give wider confidence inter intervals on it. Now, I think that it's much harder to say when things will happen than whether they happen at all. I think that in 1890, it would have been much easier to predict that someday we would have heavier than air flying machines than that it would happen in 1903. Um, I'm not even sure that that was predictable even in hindsight. Uh, if you imagine taking a thousand worlds like that one and running them forward in time, it, you might have gotten a wide distribution for when the first flying machine occurred. So, I mean, I, th I think that even if you knew exactly how to build a uh, real AI and you knew um, how much work was involved and you knew which uh, organization was going to do it first and how much funding they had, and who is working on the project, you still couldn't predict the arrival time of AI because of, uh, you know, modern project managers can't predict when their projects will complete. So it, it's really an immensely harder problem that is disguised because it has a simple answer. And we also have to be very careful not to mistake our ignorance of this problem for knowledge about it. We know that building a star is very hard because we know exactly how a star works. I mean, well, you know, there are details and so on, but we know in, in principle how a star works, and we understand that to build a star, we'd have to get a lot of interstellar hydrogen into one place, and we know how hard that would be. So we know that building a star is hard. But with AI, on the other hand, we're very confused about it. And this feels like the actual knowledge that the problem is very difficult because our confusion makes it feel very hard, but actually what our confusion means is that we need wider confidence intervals. If you don't understand AI, you don't know how much effort it will take to build AI. And while I can certainly see AI being all kinds of delaying events, I do think there is a um, fairly strong probability that we're going to see a breakthrough in understanding that lets someone uh, sit down and start a multi-year uh, blue sky research project to, compl to uh, build the AI that will uh, complete it in unpredictable time just because of project management chaos. And um, I don't think that you can use Moore's law to predict, the, to predict the arrival time of AI. I think that the human brain is so different from computing hardware that all the comparisons of how much power does it take to get human level AI are, have so much noise in them as to be completely bogus. And um, I think that instead what Moore's Law do is it makes it steady, steadily easier to create AI. So that Moore's Law is that every 18 months the minimum IQ to build an AI drops by one point. And at some point that, will, that line will cross the, the smartest researcher working on the project and a few years later we'll have AI. And I do not think it's possible to give a narrow confidence interval on when that will be. Well. I mean, I have a somewhat different perspective. I, I do think you need to break it into the hardware and software sides, which are different issues. And I think we can estimate uh, 
fairly well. There's been different attempts to estimate the amount of computation required. They all end up in fairly similar ballparks. Uh, 10 to the 16th calculations per second seems to be sufficient. I think there's a high level of confidence that people who've studied this that we'll have sufficient computation in supercomputers fairly soon and in uh, inexpensive computers even using conventional chips uh, by around 2020. The software side uh, it's a matter of getting the right level of representation. Uh, there have been regions of the brain where this fair amount of complex dynamic activity going on, but we have, in fact, mathematically characterized at the right level of abstraction, I believe, what those regions are doing. And uh, these are regions processing auditory information. We're a little bit less progressed in visual information, but there's progress being made there. Uh, the cerebellum, where we do a skill formation, which is a pattern recognition-like region. Uh, we, we have actually some effective simulations. And these are all at somewhat different levels of abstraction. Uh, we do have an upper bound, I believe, on the up amount of complexity in the design because it's in the genome. Uh, and you can include the epigenetic information and the ribosome and so on, it's, which doesn't change the, the calculation. It's, uh, it's a fairly complex system, 3,200 million bytes, but that's the level of complexity you can handle and you can approach using not Moore's law, but the equivalent in this area of understanding that level of complexity and the level of complexity we can handle. Uh, and you come out with, with time estimates around the late 2020s, and you can uh, quibble with those estimates. But that's a level of complexity that we can, that we can handle. Now, maybe there's shortcuts. Maybe the people will find some method that produces human level ability to handle hierarchical symbolic thinking that really could pass a Turing test and could go out in the internet and read and model all the, the knowledge out there and then uh, do a Turing level uh, performance. But uh, my sense is it's going to unfold more gradually by, through all of these means, through AI experimentation, a growing understanding of these principles of operation of how human beings do things, mm -hmm. and our growing insights just into studying things like human language. Uh, and I think that's going to unfold fairly gradually without uh, some shortcut. Uh, but it's going to proceed at an accelerating pace. And uh, I think, anyway. I've got a question for Bill McKibben. Bill? Yes. Yeah. Given your views, what do you think we can do to avoid existential risk, what Nick Bostrom calls existential risk in the long term, given your views? I, I think we can slow down considerably. Um, uh, the, um, you know, one of the one of the one of the ways we fool ourselves is in uh, um, thinking that the past is a reasonably good predictor for exactly what's coming. That is, uh, if we take, um, say, Ray's prediction that the last 150 years things have gotten better um, for most people. Um, there's a kind of natural human tendency to then extrapolate out and say, well, if we keep doing more and more and more things will get better and better and better. That's possible. Um, and, you know, that's how also how lots of people uh, lose their shirt in the stock market, too. Um, the, um, the other possibility is that there, are, um, that there are threshold points at which it makes sense to say uh, enough, at least enough for now, um, um, to consolidate um, um, where we are. And I think we're clearly in one of those points, that we're getting very strong signals that while certain things have, say, gotten better in the last 150 years, it's actually coming at a cost we're only now beginning to realize, both in terms of uh, physical disintegration of the world around us, I could talk about climate change all afternoon, or in terms of the social disintegration of the world around us, which I do not